Hello, everyone, and welcome to our event, The Way Forward, a conversation with World Bank Group President David Malpass and the president of Queen's College at Cambridge University, Dr. Mohamed el -Eria. I'm Pabsi Pabalan Mariano, and just like you, I am excited for today's dynamic discussion that we'll hear in just a few minutes. As the world faces multiple crises, global macroeconomic stability has never been more important. What does inflation or decreasing currencies mean for countries, especially for those vulnerable populations? And what does financial institutions or central banks, what is their role in these challenging crises? And these are just some of the things that we will try to unpack with you today because Later on during the Q&A, you will have a chance to ask your questions. For people in this room, you would just have to raise your hand and a microphone will be handed to you. And for those watching us online, please type your questions on the World Bank live chat. All right, are we ready? Let's begin. President Malpass, take it away. Okay, super. <clears throat> Morning, everybody. Uh, great to see uh, this group. Uh, great to, to uh, see the online audience. Mohammed, we, we are really uh, happy to have you. The, the world's at a critical spot. So I really want to have a conversation with you about all the topics that were raised. I have 18 questions. But first, welcome back to the World Bank. Uh, Mohammed is president of Queen's College and a long, very successful 15-year career with uh, PIMCO Asset Management, with uh, uh, Academia, a long career at the uh, IMF. Uh, and uh, But before that, the starting point was uh, right here at the World Bank. So welcome back. Tell us about that. How did you make the transition World Bank to IMF? <laughs> <laughs> So I was a graduate student. And let me just say, I am so happy to be back. And I'm happy to see people I haven't seen for decades um, here. It's wonderful to be back. Um, so first year doing my PhD, and I decided to apply for a summer intern at the World Bank. And the prestigious the World The prestigious Bank. World Bank. And they um, accepted me. And I had the honor of working in what was called at the time the senior vice president's office operation, Ernie Stern. And my job, I was telling David, was to put together a book on bilateral um, donors because the World Bank was looking at co-financing. And I spent a wonderful three months here. I also joined the World Bank IMF um, Bridge Club. So I was playing once and someone asked me, what are you doing here? I said, I'm a summer intern. He said, where? I said, the World Bank. He said, why the World Bank? Why not the IMF? And I said, what's the IMF? And he said, come and see me tomorrow. So I went to see him tomorrow. And next thing I know, I got offered a summer job at the IMF for the next summer. And that is how I ended up across the street. You know, we're still trying to recruit talented people from around the world. I'm just back from a trip to Africa. And so in Togo, we launched, we have a, an MOU with universities in the U.S. Uh, that it, with, with the idea of trying to get more and more uh, educational exchange. And then that goes into research exchange. Uh, and that then we hope uh, ends up with talented staff and also staff that ends up going back to countries and uh, 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 works there as well because capacity constraints are as they were then, but even maybe more so now, a big challenge for countries. How do they have enough talent to staff central banks and f finance ministries and education ministries, the whole range. Um, turning to the challenges of the world, and we'll jump right in. Uh, we're at a stressful macroeconomic time. Interest rates are rising. Uh, inflation has been uh, sticky. Uh, and uh, so as, as we look at where the developing world is going, uh, I've expressed concern about the outlook. We we have a report that came out last week that showed that investment levels are low. So if you just plot out the mathematics of it, it's not going to work in terms of GDP growth needed to keep up with populations, but more important, with the rising the, the, the any increase in prosperity, which of course is is a core uh, uh, goal of the bank. What so? Well, how do you assess the situation and what could be done today that would allow the world to grow faster into the future? And first, let's try to be concerned. Um, the good news is I think if we were sitting here 
in 2020 and had postulated the following, that we would have a significant disruption to global economic growth, that we would have significant disruptions to markets, that we would have a commodity shock, energy and food, and we would have the most accelerated interest rate cycle by the Federal Reserve, I think, certainly I would have said, all that will equal a developing country crisis. So the good news is that didn't happen. And it didn't happen because the bank and the fund took um, important measures because the countries themselves learned from past mistakes and didn't wait to adjust. The problem, it's a little bit like building a sand mound on a beach that you keep on adding particles of sand and nothing changes and you think you're fine. And then suddenly there is some critical issue that happens and then the whole thing changes at once. And I worry that on the present course, we are heading towards a big problem that will have a growth aspect, a debt aspect. And then with that comes a social and governance problem. Um, I've been lucky enough for the last two and a half years, it started during COVID um, with every calls for every two, two weeks with two people I respect greatly. Michael Spence, the um, Nobel Prize winner, who's done a ton of work on growth in developing countries. He was head of the Growth Commission and his knowledge of growth is, is amazing. And then Gordon Brown, who was the prime minister, who did a lot of work on not just domestic policy formulation, but also multilateral policy formulation. And when you look at, at how you solve for this, you really come down to three issues. One, covered by the World Bank report, which is a sobering read. I would encourage a lot of people to read it. The notion that growth potential is coming down is a, of real concern, and we need not accept it. One is growth models. We need to rethink growth models. We have a golden opportunity to do so because of major transitions, energy being one, digital being second, science being third. So we, we have a golden opportunity to rethink growth models. And if we don't rethink growth models, we get nowhere. That's issue number one. Issue number two is domestic economic management. We're learning a lot about what to do and what not to do, but we're not incorporating these lessons fast enough. And then the third is multilateral. Most of the issues we face are common to many countries. And if you try to solve them country by country, it's not gonna, gonna you're, not, you're simply not going to be able to solve them. So the solution lies in these three elements. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, but the alternative is so much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's stay on that. And I, I, we can uh, look at advanced economies and then developing economies and then maybe the, uh, uh, the role of the institution. But so I want to challenge a little bit um, or, uh, that what learning process is going on within the advanced economies. And even if you learned from, from the causes of inflation or the causes of, uh, of uh, a slower growth, how would you get out of the trap that we're, that we're in? That is huge levels of debt in the advanced economies. And the central banks have already bought massive amounts of bonds. So they've been duration buyers. And so whatever uh, protection you could have given from central banks into, into the various markets has already been provided. And so there's got to be some backtracking in order to get us to a sustainable steady state. What do you think? So, so I completely agree. I mean, I've been unusually critical of the Federal Reserve and people have, have sort of said, why, why are you so critical? Um, because the flow problem is adding to the stock problem. So, so when you have a stock problem, the last thing you want is the flow problem to make the stock problem worse. And that's where we are today. Um, and it matters what the U.S. does. You know, we've all bought into a system where the U.S. is at the core of the global system. The U.S. has tremendous privileges because it supplies the public global goods. The reserve currency, a financial system that intermediates everybody's savings, et cetera. But against that, the whole implicit contract is you run the system responsibly. Because if you run the core irresponsibly, the periphery then gets incredibly volatile. And what we've had, unfortunately, for the last two years is problems, especially at the Federal Reserve, that have made the core unstable. 
Um, Meaning late to rise. I mean, I think that's accepted, that the Fed was behind the curve. So, so, so number one is the complete mischaracterization of inflation for most of 2021. Number two is once they recognized that they had mischaracterized it, the last day of November, when Chair Powell went to Congress and retired, his phrase retired, tra- transitory, the phrase dangerous, very dangerous, never use the word transitory. Because right. if you tell someone something is transitory, you're telling them it's reversible and it's temporary. If you tell them it's reversible and it's temporary, you tell them don't do anything about it. So the whole world fell in love with this notion that inflation was transitory. So we didn't do enough about it. So when we retired it in in November 2021, you'd think that we would have done something about it. Reality, March, the Fed was still injecting liquidity into the system. The Fed was still having interest rates at zero. So we lost tremendous time. So if you are driving a car down a foggy highway and you keep on calling the fog transitory, and you, are, you don't slow down, and then the fog thickens, and then you realize it's no longer transitory, so you change your characteristic, but you still don't slow down, and then you realize you're in real trouble, and then you slam on the brakes, fastest increase in interest rates that we've seen in many, many decades, you will cause accidents. And we are causing economic and financial accidents. So I want to bring in fiscal policy, but then also deposit insurance and the and the banking system. And then that will bring us into developing countries. So what about the role of fiscal policy? It also was stimulative right to the end. And in fact, in many of the advanced economies, the fiscal deficits are still running very large. It was. I mean, you, you had both too much fiscal and too much monetary. Um, and the idea was that there was no speed limit, that you could do this as long as you want because the world lived in deficient aggregate demand. MMT, modern monetary theory, was you could go ahead and spend. And But there was the whole view that coming out of the global financial crisis, we had a demand problem, not a supply problem. So if you have a demand problem, inflation is not an issue, and you, you flood the system. What happened in 2022, 2020 and 2021 is we started having a supply problem way beyond the pandemic, way beyond. We have first a critical energy transition that we need to do. That is inherently inflationary. We have to do it, but it's inherently inflationary. We had labor markets where the labor force participation came down. We had geopolitical tension that changed globalization and started fragmenting it. And then you had companies that realized that they need more resilience. Just in time became also just in case. So when you rewire the supply chains, that is inherently inflationary. So the whole paradigm changed. And now we're trying to deal with that. Unfortunately, the flow problem has added to the stock problem. Yeah. So, so the, the stock problem being debt and uh, duration held by central banks. I've, I've add, uh, So I think we're in what I call post-monetarism. There, there is excess reserves at all the major central banks. So you can't call the system a monetarist system. It's uh, We're beyond that. Whatever name to put on it, post-monetarism, meaning the central banks uh, borrow from banks and buy bonds. Uh, and so how, and, and the, the Fed actually is projecting that it will restart that process because the banking system needs excess reserves. Um, wh- how, is there... Can you discuss that? I know you you kind of span and and sit above uh, academia plus uh, plus uh, asset management and uh, and and uh, the inter- multilateralism. Give us some sense. Is the academic community on board with the idea that central banks have to supply uh, HQLA, high quality liquid assets, the the backbone of the banking system, and that's going to bring us straight to commercial. To the uh, to the failure of banks in the U.S. So the academic community is going towards the notion that if you try to exit that regime, you not just deal with a dilemma, you t- deal with a trilemma. The the, the regime is uh, central banks having really big balance sheets, huge balance sheets, yeah, almost nine trillion in the case of the of, of the Fed, almost eight trillion in the case of the World Bank and uh, in, of e- ECB. ECB, I'm uh, sorry, we don't have that. ECB. Uh, our balance sheet is $640 billion, but a lot of it has been lent uh, on very long terms to very poor countries. So it's a balance sheet to I be proud of. I just gave you seven and a half trillion more. 
uh, ECB. ECB. Um, I mean, so so there is a notion that exiting this is not just a problem in terms of trying to maintain growth and trying to maintain price stability, but also a problem in terms of trying to maintain financial stability. So dealing with this trilemma is really difficult, which means policy mistakes are more likely. Then you have a second problem, which is you've distorted market signals completely. And you've created a problem for the real economy, and you've created a problem for the financial economy. The problem for the real economy is the allocation of resources, the so-called zombification of the real economy, which means productivity becomes more of an issue. The problem for the financial economy is you don't get adjustments in time. Um, you know, We have the case of Silicon Valley Bank. And there was a wonderful Brazilian CEO who said to Bloomberg that any intern in his bank would have recognized the interest rate mismatch that Silicon Valley Bank had. And what was the Fed doing looking at it and not recognizing it? And the reality is that the market signals failed. And they failed because so many bonds are owned by central banks. So I'll give you a very simple example. You know, I make these things very simple. When, when I was at PIMCO, a, a major investment management company, and suppose, David, you come in and try to convince us to invest in a particular country, in a particular company, we would grill you on balance sheet robustness, on management, on business out, outlook, on the, on the resilience, on the agility. And suppose you convinced us for all this. It's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. The next question would be, who will buy after us? Because the subsequent buyer does two things. First, they validate your purchase. If you buy an apartment in an apartment building, the minute you finish, you want 10 more people looking to buy. But you, they also provide you liquidity, as you know, in case you have to change your mind. So if I tell you the subsequent buyer is a central bank with a printing press in the basement, an infinite willingness to use it, and they're non-commercial. They don't care about price. You will not just buy uh, one unit of this. You will buy multiple units of so, it. So, so the world was willing to take duration risk. Correct. And so this misallocation of capital um, or the, the, the flow of capital went to things that it wouldn't normally have gone to. And I've, I've been critical of that because it doesn't go to smaller businesses. It doesn't go to working capital. It goes to uh, uh, wealthier people within all of the, all of the world, uh, that people that can afford to own uh, duration. So bond owners uh, were, were advantaged by that system. We've seen the inequality widen in the world. This is, of course, a core underpinning of the challenge for developing countries that uh, there, there, you know, there's not convergence going on. It's not as if the gap between the advanced and the developing countries is narrowing. You, what we would like to see is much faster growth in the developing countries than the advanced e economies. But right now, there's there's not a channel, uh, and I'm worried about the uh, the the challenges to deposit insurance. Uh, uh, also challenging banking in general. So I think one of the things the world needs to do is robustly support the idea that there needs to be uh, short-term capital, working capital, trade finance. We're, with the IFC, our, our, uh, the International Finance Corporation, we've tripled our trade finance during this uh, shortage, and that helps companies stay afloat. Uh, but on, uh, but as we look forward, there has to be long-term growth prospects uh, for the countries. So how do we rectify this? My my worry is once you're into this, once you've built a big balance sheet in the central banks, uh, uh, well, I've advocated that they shrink their balance sheets, but explain it in terms of that will provide more capital for uh, that will allow banks to make more small business loans. So be very direct. The reason we can shrink our balance sheet, we don't have to own the long-term bonds that are sitting right now on central bank balance sheets. Other people can own those. And we want banks to go lend into this uh, slow growth environment. So we're going to go the opposite way. I think what you're going to see is banks becoming more risk averse and lending less because of what has happened with the, I don't call it a crisis, but with what happened with the various tremors, with three U.S. banks failing, fourth one, First Republic being on the ropes. But, you know, all this reminds me, you know, um, this is the 70s and the 80s. The 70s, we had a recycling problem. and the 80s, we had a debt problem. 
Right. So the one thing is when the surpluses are in the wrong place. And how do you recycle them to the right places? We had that with the OPEC surpluses of the 70s. Yeah. And we now have that now. And the second problem is what do you do with countries whose stock issues, and I know you've been working on this and, and the IMF has been working on this, and it's really important. What do you do with countries right now who have accumulated so much debt that is in everybody's interest, including the creditors, to have a preemptive debt solution? Because ex post debt solutions are really messy. They're very, very messy. And they hurt, in particular, the very poor. So we have exactly the same issues as we did in the 70s and the 80s. The surpluses are in different places. The debt problems are in different places. But fundamentally, um, analytically, they're exactly the same. Yeah. Of, uh, of there so, so having me, been a misallocation of capital, and then how do you get it to the So right let me spots. ask you a question, which, huh. which I think preemptive, dealing preemptively with debt problems, okay, is important. Um, there is a massive incentive to free ride right now. If you're a private creditor, you just free ride. If you're a certain bilateral, you just free ride. Okay? And in the meantime, countries reallocate resources from social sectors to debt service that ultimately doesn't buy them very much. So how, can, how do we solve this? Yeah, the, these are big problems. And so to, to be specific on that, the, the countries, uh, even the poorest countries, are still paying massive amounts to creditors. So here you've got a situation where creditors who, by and large, have much more money than the people they're lending to uh, are taking uh, high interest rates uh, from, from, uh, from debtors. So what, we, what I've advocated and pushed really hard for is more transparency in the debts themselves. So a starting point is know what you owe and who, uh, who you owe it to. Uh, that reconciliation process is still going slowly. The World Bank has big efforts to try to collect the data. The G7 has provided the data, but other countries not so much. So we're still looking to have a better earlier reconciliation process. We've started a debt roundtable. We had the first meeting in uh, at the G20 meeting in India uh, in February, uh, and we'll have another uh, important follow-up meeting in, next week uh, of the of the debt roundtable to concretely discuss with the very with the private sector, with all of the creditors. So China included, with the Paris Club creditors, and uh, uh, and and then also bring the debtor country in early. Uh, in the in the previous process, uh, there there's been a temptation by the creditors to say, we're just going to talk among ourselves and figure out what to do with the debt of, of countries that have become unsustainable in their debt levels, that we need a more inclusive process. We're trying to achieve that. But the reality is the process is stalled. Uh, and what it has meant is year after year, even through COVID, uh, the amounts of debt grew uh, rapidly. They're also growing, and it's a challenge due to penalty interest and interest compounding on interest. So you're you're in a you're in a debt cycle trap. We did World Bank did a big report, one that uh, we're proud of in uh, uh, December of 2019, called Four Waves of uh, Debt or Global Global Waves of Debt, which kind of went it went back to the Latin debt crisis and came forward and said, you know, we're doing the same thing over and over again, allowing a lot of lending in a system that's non-transparent, and then trying uh, to resolve it. So we are. Clearly, so why, why don't we learn from our mistakes? I mean, uh, it, 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 it fascinates me that, that that we make the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, I, I, not to be too critical of lenders, but uh, and borrowers, they both have self interest in doing it. The lenders don't want to be very transparent in the loans; they want to charge a lot of interest, and they want to oversell what their uh, what, what the credit worthiness of the country. I worry about that on the municipal bond side in the U.S. There's not a lot of transparency in what the what the debtor creditor relationship is, and everyone inside the system wants to keep it going. Uh, there's there's underwriters. There's uh, uh, the the uh, the lender likes it because they're getting a good rate of interest. The borrower likes it because they don't end up with the consequences down the line. If you think of a developing country, you're the head of head of government. Uh, it looks very attractive to borrow now, uh, use it for some public purposes, and uh, and then let someone else think about the interest that's being charged. I 
I think the solution is clear. Much more transparency and also some rules of the game or guardrails uh, within the restruct within the instruments. In this case, eurobond instruments, but also bilateral creditor in, uh, uh, bilateral creditor instruments that allow them to be restructured more quickly. And that would get us away from the moral hazard. Right now, the moral hazard is uh, each time there's a debt problem, the creditors do pretty well in that debt problem. It's the people of the developing country that end up on the sh on, on, in, in shortage. Right. And I'm very worried about that going on. I was just in uh, French West Africa. Uh, the, there's uh, challenges of uh, as the as the uh, London markets close, uh, so the the bond markets that they've been borrowing from close. Then they look into their internal markets, and there's just not enough capital. Uh, to keep the cycle going. No, totally. And I, I think what people also forget is the composition of on the private side. I always used to joke that, and I saw this firsthand, is when you have these massive flows of um, bond financing to developing countries, normally because something has happened to the developed countries that pushes the capital. It, it literally pushes the capital out. You have two types of investors, what I call the resident and the tourist. The residents are those who understand the developing country. They know that things go wrong, and they're there for the long term. The tourists are literally like those who picked up a, a brochure, saw sun, decided to go, and then something goes wrong, and they immediately want to go to the airport. So what you get is, is overshooting both on the way in and on the way out. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and that dynamic in itself creates a lot of other problems. On there. Well, that goes back to what you were saying about the uh, the, the uh, willingness to take risk on 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 duration, and so that, clearly that must have been going on over the last three years. That it looked like there was an exit because the central banks were buying so many bonds, so that meant it was safe to go into right. an otherwise risky situation. So now that the uh, I mean, and one thing that's underpinning this our worry about the the next. 10 years, the, the report that came out uh, last week is uh, uh, that the, the investment is not taking place in the country. And in fact, the international capital is flowing out. Um, uh, and I, I, I mean, I, I've advocated and I did in a big speech last week and the week before, uh, there has to be a renewed effort by the developing countries to have private sectors that are attractive. So make the changes that you can now, because it doesn't look as if the international situation will relent, uh, will, will, will soften in terms of, or be, be more attractive to developing countries. So this may take a few years to have asset prices adjust. And in the meantime, Countries, the, the world markets will look to see which countries are making positive changes. I Can I ask you about countries? I sure, mean, sure. any countries that you like or uh, so? Well, well, let me <laughs> let me phrase it the other way. We're seeing pressure on currencies in quite a few countries, and I'll I'll name some and then any reactions. Uh, pressures on currencies in Nigeria and Egypt. Uh, Ethiopia is facing challenges, uh, and uh, and these are really important countries to the world. In South Africa, so I guess I've gone around the uh, tips of of Africa. These are in challenge, and it's really global. But of those four. Uh, can there be progress made? So, in some of the four, Egypt being an example, um, the currency is not only overshooting, but it's creating its own dynamics to overshoot further. And that's really worrisome. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's overshooting is that if you impose all the burden on the currency without A, having clarity on what the actual and potential demand is for foreign exchange, Two, without making reforms elsewhere, then the, yeah. the, the exchange market is not going to be able to, to cope with this. And then you create the, the dynamics that become really frightening. Um, there's nothing worse than a multiple equilibrium where, where one overshoot makes the next overshoot more likely because it's very hard to break. Can I flip that the other way? Positive side is then if you make the change, then there's their, your, your own local investors have their 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 capital outside the country. They've been they've been the exiting. They can come back in quickly 
with a positive change. Absolutely, but there's a difference between journey and destination. You know, I remember when I used to take my daughter to Disneyland, we we really excited about the destination and would forget about the journey. And then we'd get in the car, be the typical California traffic jam. I would hear a hundred times, are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'd get irritated. Then, then if we stopped, go, she'd get sick in the back of the car. And we would mismanage the journey so much that the destination was not enjoyable. Um, the problem with the overshoot is in the process of, of the journey, you are going to hit the pole really hard. That inflation really hits the pole very, very hard. You're going to shrink the middle class in the process. Um, so yes, you get to a point where the currency is so cheap that loss of capital comes well, in, but the journey itself has a lot of cost. Let, I, I want to zero in on this. Economists have developed a concept of market-based exchange rates where the level of the currency doesn't matter. It seems to me that you just described that it really does matter. And so we should have a more clear of vision in the world that uh, responsible governments should be trying to create a si system where their currencies are stable. Uh, that means there has to be some fiscal uh, viability of the country. You can't monetize your fiscal deficit through your central banks. And we just aren't there in academic theory. Uh, there, there's been this neutrality about the currency. People, you, economists express everything. You probably started it in your when you were at the World Bank as an intern, looking at the real value of things. Well, that uh, that jumps you away. The real value doesn't work for poor people because they're the ones that get hit hardest by the inflation. So the the real growth rates for a country is good for an average. But we saw periods where Brazil, for example, could show r positive real growth for years and years and years. And yet people on the bottom were getting poorer and poorer. Uh, that was in the 70s and 80s. So I really think we have to break back toward viewing the world in nominal terms that's what a uh, the 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 poor and that and world bank we are desperately trying to alleviate poverty within countries but as the currencies devalue poverty spreads that's what we, that's, the real world we see so so it, I, I think our profession has has sort of should be more open minded to three viewpoints one is that transitions matter you can't just assume you're going to go from one bad equilibrium to good equilibrium without figuring out what the journey looks like. Because otherwise, you create the multiple equilibria uh, problem. That, that's issue number one. Issue number two is behavioral science. We have to understand better why is it that policies don't impact people the way we expect policies to impact people. Okay, When they don't, we just do more of the same. It's called active inertia. You know, if, I, if, you, if, if I'm speaking to you in a language you don't understand and you don't hear me, the answer is I shouldn't speak louder. The answer is to change the language. Um, so, so, so behavioral doesn't come in again. And then the third is the role of finance. Um, we, d we don't take enough into account the feedback loops from finance to the real economy. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are attempts um, in academia to do all three, but don't underestimate how hard that is. I, I've tried to phrase, I, I do want to somehow find optimism. You mentioned at the beginning oh, I have the opt of optimism, optimism that come out of technology and so on. And one part of optimism is markets look ahead. And so they look at the environment and they can come back quickly if there's, if there's a, a, a chance of finding good investment. Yeah. The, I mean, let me tell you, the, if we wanted to be opt optimistic, which we should, one is we have golden opportunities with these massive transformation going on. Green, digital, science, these are massive transformations that allow countries to leapfrog. And it is a massive opportunity. And if we don't take that opportunity, then the deconvergence is going to be even worse. Mm -hmm. Second is we learned a ton du during the pandemic about private-public partnerships. The vaccine development was one of the most powerful public-private partnerships because people thought in risk space. Instead of just, I'm going to co-finance, they thought, which tranche, which risk tranche is catastrophic for the private sector? And if I can take that tranche out, which means I don't finance the whole ladder, I just finance the, the catastrophic, and then the private sector can fill in the other risks that they can price. It's very hard to price catastrophic risk. So we've learned a lot about private-public partnerships. How can they work? And a lot of what we're looking at will require private-public partnership because of where the capital is. 
Um, and we've, we're starting to learn more about growth models. And, I, and, and we've also learned how, how we need multilateral policy coordination. So, you know, my hope is that we, we step back and say, yes, we're not in a good place, but we've learned so much over the last few years. Let's apply that to get to a better place. Yes, though I have to say on that, the, the, the ability or the, the uh, uh, estimates of duration risk versus credit risk got, got confused and still are being confused in this environment. So that undercuts the, the, uh, the ability to make good choices within that invex, investment spectrum. I mean, I, I keep coming back to there has to be some kind of solution or starting point from the advanced economies that frees up some of the capital that's getting trapped. Uh, then the the uh, positive points that you that you laid out can have more impact. But, but come to the role of the bank. How can the bank help with that and the IMF? So if we think about the uh, world institutions, uh, wh what positive changes can be made? So you know, I, I grew up in a world in which before you argue for any public institution, you better have a clarity where the market and institutional failures are. Otherwise, that public institution is going to struggle. When, when the World Bank and the IMF were formed, it was very clear where the market failure were, where the institutional failures were. That was very, very clear. It was mostly in capital. And the IMF and the World Bank played a critical role. Today, on the IDA side, you still have that problem. On the non-IDA side, you've got to evolve a lot because you are competing with other people who can, who can deliver capital in a quicker way, maybe not as efficient, but in a quicker way, and people will opt for speed over quality. That's just the reality of, of what people do. Um, so your edge is in the staff you have. Your edge is in identifying all these transformations coming in and being literally the conductor for something that everybody is going to try to do on their own. And imagine that you are listening to an orchestra where people have music that somehow sounds the same, but it's not exactly the same. They're not quite sure how to play it. And if you lack a conductor, that orchestra is going to sound absolutely awful. So, you know, it is for the, for the non-IDA side, it's beyond financial flows. It really is beyond financial flows. Now, that is hard to do. I told um, David that the IMF has a structural advantage over you which is the Article Ooh. 4 consultations. Uh -huh. He didn't like that. Uh -huh. but, but the Article 4 consultations no, that's, that's true. <laughs> basically forces 190 countries to have annual discussions in a manner that forces multilateralism. So Article 4 is when the IMF uh, examines each country, including the advanced economies, and gives them a, a dialogue-type advice. And discusses on what them in a multilateral do. forum, right? And that, that, that is a structural advantage and I always say, you know, if structure can do the heavy lifting, I would love to have a development Article 4 um, issue where not only do you have the development dialogue with individual developing countries, but you have them in the um, advanced economies. Uh -huh. I always tell people, you can't be a good house in a poor neighborhood. It just doesn't work. You've got to care about the neighborhood. So we are we uh, engage in quite a dialogue with the developing countries. One and we work closely with the IMF. And so one of the challenges is uh, the the uh, the the incentive structures. And you're right. You're you're saying the non ida parts of the bank. So we'll, being specific, the IBRD, International Bank for Reconstruction and Devel Development, the IFC and MIGA, all work together uh, to try to help countries create an environment that's attractive to capital. Uh, coming in. This is middle-income countries, but that's done in competition with other lender sources or investor sources that the countries may attract. And so one of the uh, one of the challenges that we face is we have to do it efficiently within the World Bank group in order to really attract uh, the country toward that dialogue. Uh, we're, we do that through fiscal discipline through having a, an attractive lending package uh, that's available to the countries. And hopefully, as, as a conductor, I, I, I guess I, I think of it as uh, a big role in project and reform management uh, that the bank can do over a period of years. So one of the uh, value propositions, or so the IMF has Article 4s, uh, the bank 
has uh, a long relationship with a country and so can really stay the course over a 10-year period that it, it, where we can find leaders around the world that l- think in terms of a long time frame. They want their country to do well, their people to do well, and are willing to really uh, g- make that, uh, what you call it, the voyage, the, 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 journey. Uh, the journey. So the journey is going to go on for a while in order to have fiscal responsibility, in order to have monetary responsibility, regulatory and trade openings in countries. That you know the challenge is at each point it's tempting for governments to say you know that's really hard and I've got this easier path in the short run um, and that really is what we're facing I think over and over again that the the short term path that benefits some of the people in the country is easier for the country than the long term path where the bank is going to be engaged. We offer that explicitly to countries. We'll be here for 10 years uh, if we can make progress on this trade barrier or on this investment barrier, this this blockage to private sector. They look at it, say, you know, we've got a lot of people that are dependent on this blockage. So we'll decline. Um, What do you you think? How could we break through that? So so first, let me say that realigning incentives is really important, and we should do a lot more thinking on this. Um, I've spent over four decades um, literally defending to, in front of government people and non-government people the role of the IMF and the World Bank. Um, it's getting harder because if you don't also address the macro issues, voice representation and governance, Okay, it's it's not credible. It's simply not credible because we go in there, and I say we because I still feel part of the process, and we argue for accountability, we argue for all sorts of things. And then they look around and ask a few questions that we can't answer. We literally cannot answer because some of our practices don't make any sense at all. And they say, well, who, who are you really representing? And don't underestimate how problematic that issue is. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in the interest of, of, of the whole membership to take seriously the voice representation and, and, and governance issues. Otherwise, at the micro level, people will not buy in um, because they're going to ask, is there a hidden agenda I don't know about? And the minute you put that idea in someone's mind, when it gets hard, they'll abandon your path and they'll go for, for, for the easy path. So the, the realignment of incentives has to happen at the micro level, but also has to have an envelope that encourages people to, st- to stick the course um, on that. And I know that this is really tough and I shouldn't raise issues like this, mm. um, but I, I think that these organizations play a really critical role. And, and the irony of it is we could not today recreate these organizations. So we, we have to cherish them because they are very special. In, in today's environment, the world is fragmenting, right? And, and so it's really important to preserve these institutions. So, uh, well, I mean, that's tackle tough issues. There's been the push to say reinventing Bretton Woods, uh, IMF and World Bank. I think of it in terms of reinventing development. And that means on the principles that we've uh, talked about some, I I think stable currencies are a a core starting point. Central banks that actually operate within within some kind of uh, framework is important. Fiscal discipline by the countries is important because otherwise uh, you're taking capital away from other from or either you're borrowing from the future or taking it from private sector and growth parts of your economy. So that's a principle. And then having some kind of uh, recognition that jobs are going to come from uh, investors that actually put money to work in countries. So we start with that as as a framework and then uh, push it, uh, encourage it, and really try to build it. Uh, the the point that we're at in the world is the countries look at that and say, boy, that will take a long time. I don't think I'm in it for the long run. Yeah, well, I just say, come to the World Bank you know, headquarters. I walked in today and poor security person, I said, can I take a picture of this? And he said, a picture of what? I said, what's written on the wall here? And he didn't quite know what to say to me. So I said, you know, look, it's public. And it is our vision is a world without poverty. You know how powerful that is? Yeah. That's incredible, incredibly powerful. Um, and every time I walk in, I look, I look at this um, because I, th- I think that that is so incredibly powerful. Yeah. 
And that still motivates and di- uh, the, the, the institution of saying, let's, let's at, have some data, and we do that worldwide, of where there's poverty, recognition that it's not just in the poorest countries, but also poverty uh, in middle-income countries, and what's our plan to, to get at it. And there is a lot of energy and effort uh, to identifying that. Uh, we just had a, you know, a, a, a in-depth discussion in our board uh, uh, w- with management and board on the evolution of the bank, uh, and it goes to this issue: of, Are we reinventing Bretton Woods institutions, or are are we really trying to find better ways to interact with poverty? Uh, the, a strong reaffirmation by the board that that's a core mission. That um, rising uh, uh, shared prosperity, meaning uh, that middle middle income, poor, the bottom half needs to go up really faster than the top half, uh, or and go up both in a positive direction. So that's reaffirmed, and also an awareness of the public goods that uh, that surround all of this. Every uh, people are all around the world are interconnected. And therefore, there has to be full consciousness of that. So there, I, my sense is there's been a uh, a pretty full recognition of uh, that that there's an importance of the role. And then the challenge is how do you get enough resources? You know, constantly people come back. Well, uh, there there sh- there should be a tripling of World Bank resources within the capital structure that we have. There we are expanding that. We managed to do thirty percent more. With the existing staff, the existing payroll uh, during COVID and during the uh, during the food uh, crisis that we're facing uh, right now, which is good. That's uh, you know, if you measured productivity from the World Bank, it would be a pretty strong uh, positive indicator. Uh, but then, as you go forward, if you want to then double it from there, you've really got to be thinking about it and some kind of new capital structure or new relationship with countries, which. Uh, we, you know, we've looked under all stones, uh, tr- trying to find where there are ways we are going to expand our leverage. Uh, w- and the, the shareholders have decided that they're w- willing to take a little more risk than they were before. Oh, I want to raise a problem or a challenge for you. Uh, as we make more loans to uh, countries on the margin, the composition of our portfolio actually changes in a way that allows less leverage. So one of the challenges that we've run into, as we try to leverage higher, the new lending goes to countries that are more marginal, and it doesn't allow the leveraging. Any you, you're so, so, so let me just say, I mean, the, 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 and I know that you're thinking about that. There's lots of stuff you can do with your balance sheet that doesn't threaten your AAA status, and I would never threaten your AAA status. That is really, really important. Um, but I think ultimately, if we look forward 10 to 20 years, and, and the bank and the IMF do not achieve um, what they're capable of, it won't be because of resources. And here's a, here's a hypothesis. It will be because of the inability to get buy-in about the changes that are needed. Um, there's been incredible work done by Don Sull, um, a behavioral scientist at um, MIT, asking the question, why do successful companies fail? Why is it that IBM, on the eve of the PC revolution, mm-hmm. that had every reason to succeed, failed, was almost bankrupt two years later? It is not because they have a blind spot. It is not because they reframe and look for confirmation bias. It's because they fall into this trap in middle management and below of active inertia. So let's take the example of IBM. IBM recognized that the PC revolution was incredibly disruptive to its model, that it could no longer be the, the brand in tech, having been incredibly profitable, huge R&D, if it didn't evolve what it did. And what it did is mainframe. And it realized that the PC would come in, would take some cl- customers away, would bring more customers here. So if you are management, what you want to do is occupy the space and then take your mainframe upstream charge premium pricing, and maintain profit margin. The absolutely right approach. Absolutely right. Management put it forward to the board. The board approved it, and they were going to go from what's called a bulleted approach to a barbell approach. Businesses tried this all the time. Two years later, IBM was almost bankrupt. 
and wouldn't exist today if they hadn't reinvented themselves. Why? Because they didn't explain enough what they were trying to do. So as you went down the organization, you were telling people, I'm taking you out of your comfort zone. I'm taking you to places where you haven't been before. And they didn't quite understand why it is they were doing this. So what do they do? What all of us do is we go back to our comfort zone and you end up in the muddled middle. And I think that, that the main challenge for a lot of these organizations that have to evolve, that have every attribute that allows them to evolve successfully, is to think in terms of, oh, it's an external issue. It's a resource issue. Okay? As opposed to what, 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 is, what is the strategy? Why are we doing it? Let's socialize it. Let's buy it in. Okay? Otherwise, you end up by relaxing what you think are the external constraints, and you never relax the internal constraints. I'll, I'll mention two thoughts on that, and then I know we have audience questions. One is uh, we're trying to do that, just as you said, on with the uh, with the private uh, capital enabling. So as the bank and the IFC and the MEGA various arms worked, it was it was relegated to a spot, and we're trying to bring that into the mainstream. So I hope for the for the bank people that are here, everyone feels comfortable or tries to get comfortable with the idea that a principal mainstream uh, uh, framework for the World Bank Group is to enable uh, private capital to come into countries, private investment to take place, because it w there's not going to be the ability to depend on on outside capital uh, the way maybe that was possible over the last ten or fifteen years. Uh, so that's one. And then on climate change, same thing going on. It's a effort we've organized it around these uh, CCDRs, the Country Climate Development Reviews, that give a framework for country programs and for regional programs. And then, but implementing that is going to be, it's a, it's a big change for the way people operate within the World Bank group, necessary, uh, but I hope uh, that can come together with, uh, not, not in the barbell that you described for IBM, but in a successful way that there's a smooth transition to that. Let's see if there are, uh, what, what questions come up. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise. We do have some questions that came online. And uh, for people here in the room, please raise your hand if you do have a question. So let's start from the online questions. This is from Janine. If Bretton Woods con uh, were to conference, if Bretton Woods conference was to happen today, what kind of MDB system would it create? So that's one. Um, and maybe we can take one more, um, for also from online. Um, Aman from New Delhi, how can we shift from a labor-intensive economy mm. to a capital-intensive economy while addressing unemployment? So those were the two so, questions from us. So, those are those are great. Uh, I'll I'll say a little and then uh, and then see Mohammed on on from labor to capital intensive. Uh, so I'll use a phrase opportunistic. So within countries, there's different paths to do that. And so for India, uh, they are actively trying to have more of a service economy. That means you need skills. Uh, and for countries around the world, uh, well, for whatever reason, the world is oriented toward English, uh, and so English language skills become really important. India has an advantage that gives you services uh, build up, uh, and you know China is actively trying to allow services. So I I would just say opportunistic as far as how you create Bre Bretton Woods system today. You know there's a core difference, and I want to hear Mohammed's views. We're not on the gold standard, so in 1944, a high priority of the Bretton Woods institutions was preserving. Uh, countries are returning them toward their gold standard. So now you really have to come up with what is the reinventing development in a floating exchange rate world. And so I'm I'm saying it would it needs to be built around macro policy uh, coherence within countries and that connected to their regulatory policies. Mohammed. I, I went first because no, I... No, no, I'm I, happy you went first. Yeah. Um, on, on the first issue, on the second issue about labor-intensive, capital-intensive, um, I think that it, that is a false bogeyman that we put in front of people. I mean, look at the U.S. What does the U.S. have today? 1.67 jobs for every person unemployed. And the U.S. has one of the lowest unemployment rate in its history. And it's not because the U.S. hasn't evolved from labor-intensive to, ca to capital-intensive because the service sector comes in. So we mustn't make that an excuse for not doing things um, that we can. On, 
on what would I do different in the Bretton Woods, um, I would actually keep a lot of, of what I said. I would give the bank a bit more structural help um, in terms of its activities, but I would allow for three things that are very difficult to do. First, regional lending. Okay, the bank should be able to do much more regional lending than it does right now. Um, whether you look at power, pro power um, projects. Who would you lend to? You lend to a consortium of countries and you would create a structure that allows countries to come in and out um, into coalitions and share the, the, mm -hmm. the debt servicing. Mm -hmm. right? Very hard to do right now. Very, very hard to do. Um, the second issue is a, a, a sort of clearing house, a best practices house for ideas. Um, you know, there was the old notion of the knowledge bank, and I really need it. Um, I come across a lot of, a lot of cases, um, debt being one of them. Who do we go to? Who do we call? If we're a small developing country, who do we call? And we end up by calling the wrong people. You end up by calling the investment bankers. And if you're calling the investment bankers on your debt restructuring, you're in trouble already. I mean, you, you, you shouldn't start that. Um, and, then, and then the third issue is making um, um, collaboration with other institutions much easier than it has been. You know, we talk a lot about bank fund collaboration. It's not as easy as it should be. Um, there should be much more aligned incentives for bank fund collaboration, let alone collaboration with other institutions. Um, we recognize that one. So I had lunch with Crystalline on Monday, uh, and so I went there. We trade and and go back and forth, and we talk about that. Uh, but then inherently, there's a difference in that uh, a liquidity provider and a development provider, and we do explicitly talk about we just want a good outcome for people in this country. Uh, okay, but then. Who, whose instruments, how, how do you actually uh, 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 create the instruments that overlap to do it successfully? So there is dialogue on that. Wh whether we're successful, uh, you know, we can, time will tell. All right. I believe right. we have one more question in the room. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. My name is Indermeet Gill. Uh, 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 and the first thing I want to say that that, that, that that is great to have you here and you should come here more often. Uh, uh, the second thing, uh, uh, the, the, I guess my question is the following. You said at the beginning that you are pleased to see that despite the multiple crises, there hasn't been a widespread big crisis in developing countries. And you also said that in some measures because of what the bank and the IMF have done over the last three years. So, 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 so here's my question, and it's a sincere question. Uh, what exactly, in your opinion, has the fund done to help? Um, okay, the debt service suspension initiative was very important. If we didn't have that, it would have created issues. I think the amount of fund lending or effort to get money into the system in the beginning was significant. The new facilities were significant. Um, don't underestimate what would have happened had the multilaterals not responded. The only I'm not asking you about multilaterals. I'm asking you about the fund because the debt service suspension initiative started here. No, no. I, so I don't distinguish between, you know, when I think of, of sisters, okay. the Bretton Woods sisters, I think of you as together um, because I really do think you're together. And I go back, you know, I'll give you a simple example. Um, if you wanted to get better collaboration, the annual appraisal should have an element here. To what extent have you helped collaborations with other institutions? Strange incentives. When I was at the IMF, there was no benefit to, to collaborating with well-planned colleagues. There wasn't. And no one saw it. No, no one realized it was important, et cetera. Um, so, you know, th there's little tricks that we can bring from the corporate world that simply realign incentives. And everybody's better off. But again, um, so, Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say that, you know, because you said that we need to find preemptive debt solutions. You're right. absolutely right. What exactly has the fund been doing to try to get that done? The so, second thing is you said that the Article 4 is a big advantage of the thing. Take a look at some of the Article 4s, the Jordan Article 4, for example. Take a look at many of them and see whether or not they've been actually using those well, right? And then you said that, that, you know, that you actually have to bring new money to countries that need stability or growth thing. I mean, outside of Argentina, Egypt, and Pakistan, and a few other countries, you know, where exactly has the fund been bringing in new money? I mean, I'm not talking about showing them the money. I'm talking about bringing them the money. Huh? Okay, so, so it's not because I still receive a pension from the IMF. <laughs> but 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I have the health health care? That's really what I... Um, I don't get it there either. Um, look, first of all, we, we need to figure out whether we need more sticks and fewer carrots to get the debt service issues out there. If it were up to me, I would use much more sticks. The institutions can lend into arrears. And you can, re you can change the incentive system from free riding to having to be bailed in, okay? But it requires some difficult decisions. And those decisions haven't been made, although they can be made. On Article 4, I don't know how many Article 4s I've been part of. There's three elements of Article 4s. What happens in, during the discussions in capitals and in provinces, what is written and what's made public. And as you go down, it changes the frankness and everything else. So, so don't judge the whole Article 4 process mm -hmm. simply by what you see at the end, mm -hmm. because there, there are multiple stages beforehand that look very different. I remember when, when we, we agreed to release the, the, the reports, okay, they were changed. I mean, they, because there are certain things that they were softened. They were softened. Mm -hmm. Right, but it didn't soften the discussions that happened beforehand um, in these discussions. Uh, these are great, great, great Just topics. Just hope I can continue getting my pension after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Do you have any final words before we end the event? Well, I'll just thank Mohammed uh, uh, for for joining us in great conversation, and we we uh, uh, discussed a lot of tough issues, starting with advanced economies and their their role which is so big in the world and then this uh uh challenge i think it's an immense challenge uh facing development how do how can it be restarted and uh where is the capital gonna where is the uh where's the new investment let's call it the investment on the ground going to come from so the world's got a got a uh a super challenge going on i think uh, this is really useful to talk about it. And thanks for joining us. So it's for me to thank you and then to thank you all. Um, you may not be sufficient for, for a better world, but you're very necessary for a better world. Um, Wait, let's phrase that, uh, that. This may, from the world standpoint, it may not be fully sufficient, but it's necessary. It's a starting point and then add on to that. So I would add fully necessary. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, fully necessary. So thank you very much for everything you do. Great. Thank you. Thank you.